And folks, this week, the Let's Run.com podcast is brought to you by our new shoe site. We, we've been saying for years, we're really going to formally, finally launch it and keep it up, but we're going to be doing that. You can go there now, Let's Run.com shoes. If you're listening to this podcast, you're one of our most valued listeners. You're probably a real fan of the site. And if you want to have to keep the site free, we really need this shoe site to take off. So you can go there now. You can find the best rated shoes, the best rated shoes under $100, the best price for a specific shoe. If you want to run a marathon, you can find that type of shoe. You can high mileage shoe, anything you want. Very simple. But we also really need you to submit your own shoe review. So please, whatever shoe you're going in there, check out the site and then review that shoe as well. We have over 6,000 shoe reviews, but we need a lot more. So please do that. Also, we'd love to hear your feedback on the site. So you can download one of these screen recorders and just spend like go straight to the site and just record what your stream of consciousness is as you go to that site. It would really help us. Then email it to Weldon Johnson at let'srun.com, and we will really, really appreciate it. Maybe we'll send you a free pair of shoes. So let'srun.com slash shoes. Also, if you want to save 15% on your CBD oil products, go to floydsofleadville.com and type in the program, the code RUN2019. Stars of track and field you are. The stars of track and field are beautiful people. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Let's Run.com's Track Talk. This is your fearless host, Let's Run.com co-founder Robert Johnson, welcoming you to the program. And what a show we have this week. First of all, if you want to join us, call us 844-LET'S-RUN. But what a show. A very, very busy week last week, guys. High School Nationals, Brooks PR Invite, Adidas Boost Games, two Diamond League meets, Oslo and Rabat. Where to begin? So much to talk about. But guys, let's talk about the big thing going on this week, starting tomorrow, and it ties into what happened last week. Tomorrow is, do you know what tomorrow is? Anyone? Unfortunately, I do. Yeah, I do as well. Robert, enlighten us. Folks, tomorrow, January 20th, 2019, will be the three-year anniversary of the Jamad and alleged doping reign in Spain. January, Robert? Excuse me, June, June 20th. And um, if you remember, there was a big doping raid in Spain three years ago. And basically since then, they, they said they found all these drugs and everything and nothing's happened. And last week, one of Jamal's star pupils, Gazebe de Baba, she won the big race in Rabat. Seven people broke four minutes. Great race up front. Safan Hassan sets a new national record, 355, but she loses to de Baba. Fantastic race. De Baba, I mean, coming off the final turn, Dababa was grimacing and really digging deep. It looked like Sasan was set up to pass her, but Dababa dug deep, celebrated, and got the win. Fantastic race. American Jenny Simpson broke four there, meaning she's done done that 10 years in a row. So, guys, what does this all mean? I mean, to me, it's it's kind of depressing, I got to say. Like, Jama Arden, I think we remember when this news broke in 2016, it seemed like the IAF had him dead to rights, right? The Spanish police raided his hotel that he was staying at they found syringes with epo in the rooms of i think it was his th- physiotherapist we had an athlete Gonzebe de Barba, who the previous year had smashed the world record that everyone knew was doped held by chinese athlete the only women who would ever run that fast or close to that fast were dope chinese women from the 1990s so i think people kind of thought okay we got him and in fact, they did not get him. Now, apparently, you know, we, we don't even know where Jama Arden is right now. There was an article in The Guardian last year saying that he was facing up to four years in prison for Spain for putting his athletes' health at risk and supplying them with PEDs. But he has to actually, they had no trial date set and they would have to extradite him to return to Spain. I don't know why he would go back. Musaya Bala, one of his athletes, Qatari 800 runner, was arrested at the time. He hasn't competed since 2016, but he's also not officially banned. So I don't really know what's up with him. But to me, it's just, I don't know. I think very a lot of people in the sport are suspicious of Dababa. I know Jenny Simpson doesn't particularly care for her. I remember watching the 2017 Worlds and she came through the mix zone and was excited when she thought that Dababa had not made the final. And that's rare to see for an athlete to sort of celebrate that other thing. She actually did make the final in the end, but she finished last in the final. So I, I don't know. It's just it's strange for me to see the IAAF sort of pumping up Dababa's accomplishments on Twitter and celebrating what she's doing when 
there are a lot of people in the sport who are very, and with good reason, very skeptical of what she's been doing. A couple points of order. First of all, Dababa now is no longer coached by Jama Auden. So just to get that, I don't know, factual thing out there. But the whole thing is very frustrating, right? Like, I think a key tenet of any sort of justice system is like you, you need a sort of quick, quick resolution. And three years later, after this prominent raid, nothing's happened. And maybe that's because Jama won't go back to Spain. But from a doping standpoint, we sort of assume something's going to be resolved one way or the other. I feel like they almost should say like, we're still looking into this in some ways with doping. There's always a suspicion on everyone, right? You can always be drug tested at any moment. Essentially you have to like drop your pants, show your privates to someone and watch them drug test. I mean, there's, you're not operating under a system presumption of innocence, but I think it's sort of unfair to the people accused. If they're just always, we never know what happens. And I don't know, we need some better resolution than this. Because every time somebody watches Gonzabi Dibaba run, there's a suspicion, right? I mean, there, it's just sort of natural. She was the most prominent person of the group. Drugs were fi- found in some of the rooms. And yet three years later, like not a single doping thing has come out of that. It's just sort of crazy. So I, f- I just sort of wish there would be some updates or something, I don't know, from the anti-doping unit or from the IWF. I feel like now with the Castor Semenya stuff, the IWF communications department is doing a tremendous job of trying to to kind of change the, how things are presented and discussed. And I think feel like somehow now with this doping thing, once we sort of realize it's three years, it's just frustrating. Let me play devil's advocate. I mean, normally I'm leading the anti-doping fight, but guys, I mean, maybe he's innocent. As I was telling John, John's so, I, it, it, it shocks me. John's like leading the pitchforks on this one. He, it really bothers him. I, like the, the whole Zababa thing bothers him. Like the CC Telfer thing bothers me. I mean, I, I was so upset about the CC Telfer thing last week. I, I had to call our coach to just talk to him off the record about some things, try to calm me down. But I mean, what more do you want? You, you, you follow the guy for weeks with the police force, you raid his bags, you, you, you look at his syringes and you don't charge him with anything. So maybe there wasn't anything there. They found EPO, Robert. They allegedly, found EPO allegedly, at the hotel. Have you seen that in the court of law? Allegedly, they found EPO. No one's been banned. So I, I don't know. I mean, if we're going to talk about the three-year anniversary, folks, June 3rd, 2015. What happened on June 3rd, 2015? Jonathan, go. ProPublica, BBC, Alberto Salazar investigation. Correct. We're on the four-year anniversary of the Alberto Salazar ban, or lack of ban. So... I don't know. Like every time we watch Galen Rupp, do we have to think he's a doper? I actually think the same thing. I think, well, the longer we go, they don't have anything. Now I was told, well, I thought something might be coming down on that front last year. I was told by the end of the year, something would happen. Well, here we are six months later. So I, 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 if I don't know, I mean, they thought they were going to do it last year and it's six months later. They haven't done it. The longer you go, the less likely it is to happen. So, well, I think I agree a hundred percent, Robert. I'm saying it's unfair to every party involved this sort of goes on forever and i think yeah Auden might say look the trainer could have been the one doping i wasn't doping i mean there's no proof obviously that gonzabe de baba was doping and i don't think john and i are trying to say that there's no proof that jama Auden was doping his athletes what's his name hamza Driosh. there's some been out four allegations there but 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 that's why i think three years later we need some sort of resolution try him in absentia the, the at least the anti-doping people should say something. I, I don't know. I just feel like this suspicion of smoke around somebody forever isn't fair to anybody involved. I want resolution. I want them to be charged. I guess you can't clear them, but I, I don't know. If someone's got some ideas, email us. I'm just, it's very frustrating to me. I think it's just frustrating to everyone when they say they found vials and syringes, or syringes, not vials, syringes of EPO at the hotel or in the trash outside this hotel and no one has been banned. As a prominent coach who coaches several prominent athletes, used to coach several prominent athletes, to me and anyone who cares about clean floor, clean, clean sport, it's just an incredibly frustrating situation. Well, they found vials of, of testosterone in, in, in Alberto Salazar's bag, and he would give the massage nights up, the masseuse nights off. He has a he has a prescription for testosterone, though, Robert. Okay, but why is he giving massages when he's not a certified masseuse? I don't know. He likes to miss. I, I don't. I didn't pry into that. It, just because he has a, subscri- a prescription for testosterone does not mean he's rubbing down Galen Rupp with testosterone. I just feel like there's a little xenophobia going on here, John. 
racism too. Yeah, that's the right. When you don't like how it's going, just cry, cry racism, and that's uh, that's how it works. I know you're kidding, but can, can someone tell me Zebe de Baba's not? I, I thought John Biden was going back to Spain every year and still doing his training camps in Sabado. And because Zebe is not coached by him, who coaches? I did not know this. And literally, have lost a year and a half with the child. But John, who coaches her? Where does she train? I actually don't know who coaches her, but I do know she's not coached by Arden anymore, officially at least. And that gets us to our tweet of the week. Let's talk about it, John. You're the one that saw it, I think. Yep, the tweet of the week is courtesy of statistician Jesse Squire. Now, like I said earlier, the IAAF has sort of been pumping up DeBarba's accomplishments on their Twitter feed. Or, Sorry, this is the Diamond League Twitter feed. It says, Gonzebe DeBarba has won at least one Diamond League 1,500 meters every season since 2012 except one. Can you tell us which one without looking? And Jesse Squire quotes the tweet and says, I think it was the year Jama Arden was arrested. And you know what? He's right. She didn't win one in 2016. Now, that's actually the tweet itself is flawed because she didn't win one in 2018 either. So it's just an incorrect tweet. But I think we all sort of got to chuckle about Jesse's response to that one. Yeah, I laughed out loud. But, you know, what's the IWF communication department supposed to do? They're supposed to, like, first of all, it's probably some intern or something doing this or just some new staffer. They're supposed to know which athletes people think might be doping and then judge them that way. I mean, hell, half the sport might not get any publicity that way. Great tweet by Jesse. And then I was looking at Jesse's Twitter feed, and I have good news, people, good news. In his feed, he retweets a tweet by a guy named Daniel Freebe, F-R-I-E-B-E, a journalist mainly covering pro cycling. And then the tweet says, news in Lola Keep, it's a French newspaper, says that the Chatenay Malabry anti-doping lab is re- refining its EPO testing method to make micro doses detectable for 48 hours plus as against only 24 hours today. Not ratified yet, but this t- test could be ready for 2020. And it could also go back 10 years in samples. So if we could have better EPO testing, essentially standing, expanding the window, doubling it from only one day to two days. But if we, that's still 100% progress. This could be huge. We might have a bunch of EPO positives going backwards. So the key to anti-doping is we need better testing, right? I mean, this whole thing shows, I don't know if for certain, if, you know, Jama Uden was doping athletes or the trainer was doping athletes. But I'm pretty sure, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm pretty sure when EPO is found in rooms, somebody's using it and not a single person tested positive. And I also can pretty much assure you that the IWF timed the raid and a bunch of drug tests probably to like optimize when people would test positive and still not a single test in person tested positive. Right. So I mean, it's almost like, what's the point of this? And then we're going to have more on this going forward. But Jerry Lawson, a great 100 man, a long jumper, almost won Olympic gold. He's been banned, and John thinks that he's innocent and is going to be doing a story on it. But he had, he had like w- something that weighed less than one gram of rice of, of a steroid in his system. And he had been, if you eat beef in America, you can easily have that much in your system. They let off A.G. Wilson for a similar infraction, but he doesn't get off. And. Uh, there's a lot to that story. So it's like, okay, we're going to get somebody on some technicality who's probably innocent, but then we're going to let people who have EPO in their hotel room get off. So very, very frustrating. But guys, let's talk about the actual race. What did you think of it, John? Well, I think if the race is run like that at Worlds, which Dababa won't have a rabbit at Worlds. I know we're skipping ahead quite a lot, but I just the thought that came through my head watching that is if the race is run like that at Worlds, Jenny Simpson doesn't have a prayer because – Jenny Simpson, one of the best championship 1500 runners of all time. I don't think that's hyperbole. She's got four global medals, including a world title. But she can't run 355. And Gonzebe Dababa can. And I do think if if it's 355 in the final, maybe Laura Muir could do that. Laura Muir has run 355. But I just don't think Jenny Simpson can get to that level. I think she can close quickly. I think if it's anything... 358 or slower maybe she's going to be in contention but if Dababa runs like she did in Rabat in the world championship final I I just don't think Simpson has a chance to 
to to to win that race. And but maybe you know maybe Shelby Houlihan. I don't know. We'll see what she can do. Can Shelby Houlihan get that fast? I mean, what do you guys think? If is it just game over if the Barber runs three fifty five like that? First of all, it's, it's amazing to me that Jenny Simpson has won all these medals. I mean, when I look at it repeatedly, you know, I mean, she, I guess she's run with three fifty seven as her PR. Is that right, John? Yeah. But I mean, she's oftentimes right around three fifty nine. But look, Debaba's significantly better. Hassan significantly better. Faith Kipiak gown. I mean, she hasn't raced this year, but obviously she won the Olympics. I, I think she's better. Houlihan's younger and better. I mean, I, I would say Simpson almost has no chance for a medal. But I, I trust Simpson. I mean, right now, if I'm looking ahead to Worlds, I, I trust Hassan being coached by Salazar to get the peak right better than Debaba. So. Uh, you know, and and I trust Simpson to get her peak right as well. So, you know, she's not that far off from third in that race. But the problem is Laura Muir's in there as well, and, and I really trust her coaching. So, I don't see how Simpson beats Hassan or Muir. Period. If Kip Yagen comes back, same thing. But she's coming back from maternity leave. So, you know, I mean, I, I think that Simpson kind of, if you line everybody up in the world, she's never one of the top three in terms of talent level. But she she may they're not running 100% when they need to, and she often is. I think a few things help Simpson. I mean, the rounds help her. She's a strength runner. But, yeah, I mean, Debaba's run 350 for 1,500. I mean, Simpson's run th- as good as she is. She's run 357. I mean, if Debaba's on her A game, nobody can run with her. But, you know, I wouldn't say 355 it's ball game over because they ran 355 in Rabat, and I think if Hassan hadn't tried to pass her on the turn, she might have beaten her if she waited, like – I thought for sure she was going to beat her coming off the turn. So Hassan could beat her. But then there's the question that Hassan may be doing the 5K and the 10K. Is is that s- still the latest from that camp? I mean, I think it's crazy to think she should run the 10K. But she's run tremendous half marathons. So is that an easier double than doing the 15 and the 5? So it's just sort of crazy. Uh, Shelby Houlihan, I don't know. Should we, we can talk about worlds and that sort of stuff later. But like, where's Shelby Houlihan? Where's Evan Jager? Where's Matt Centrowitz? Some of the the Bowerman stars are sort of MIA, at least some of them. Um, and we're getting a little bit, you know, USA's isn't that far off. And but you got to make the team if you're going to be at Worlds. And Pool hands way better than a lot of the other women. But the women's fifteen hundred is pretty good. And obviously, you have Simpson, that sort of stuff. So I don't know. Where are these people? Well, we know Shelby's foot was injured after indoors. Jager and Centro, I have to assume, have been injured because they're not competing. Well, Craig Virgin confirmed that, world, former World Cross Country champion, confirmed that he's talked to Jager's parents. He's indeed injured. But yes, Jerry Schumacher, if you're listening to the podcast, please send me a text so we can get an update. The one, and one thing, just to return to 1500, I have so much respect for Jane Simpson, and she's one of the smartest, best racers I've ever seen. I think she can still medal, but... Yeah, I think you look at that race and you say you just. I think back to 2015, and I just think that's not good for if she, if she runs like that. Debaba is basically unbeatable. We saw it world indoors last year. She just crushed Muir and Hassan in the 1500 and the 3K. Yeah, Jenny, if you're listening to the podcast, please follow my advice from a number of years ago. I know I haven't quite had the faith of you in the 1500, despite your repeated medals, but I'm actually hoping you get smoked this year in 2019. So you have the impetus to move back to the steeplechase. Move back to the steeplechase. You could win gold in 2020. Back back to 949 flat appears to be the barrier. Um, and I think you can do that. So, Jenny, please go back. It would be so exciting. Wouldn't it be amazing? We have the gold and the silver medalists in the last world. And we add in Jenny Simpson. What? So you just made, I mean, Robert, this, this argument, first of all, I, I can't believe you're still on this corner. Like, Robert called me last week and he's just telling me, so wait, why? I don't get it. Why didn't she? Why hasn't she gone back to the steeple yet? I'm like Robert. She has four medals at Worlds in the Olympics. Like, how much more could she possibly do? She's one of the most decorated 1500 runners of all time, and he's still like, nah. She can go back. She should go back to the steeple. And you made your point. We already had one, two at Worlds. So you just want them? Like, we don't have enough good women steeplers. As much as I respect Willis and, and Simpson, running for the bronze isn't isn't that exciting to watch. I like to watch him run for gold. Okay, but you think after 10 years off in the steeple, she's just going to be able to hop back in and beat Beatrice Chepkoach and Nora Gerudo and Coburn and Frerichs? I mean, I think she has a better chance. To, I don't know. I think it's kind of wishful thinking, Robert. 
Okay, guys, speaking of the 1500, so I put it up on the website in the week that was. Now published, Stefan Hassan is now the world record holder with 16 sub fours. And I was trying to compare, think when I was doing this, I, I didn't come up with a comparable men's list, but I was trying to think like, what is a sub four for the women equivalent to for the men? I mean, you can't really compare it to the world record because, well, we at least thought the Chinese world record was definitely doped and I won't say much about the Zimbabwe, but I kind of thought like, well, okay, let's say 355 is what clean people can run. So four flat is about five seconds off that. So in my mind, I kind of thought like, well, occasionally you see like a 328 on the men's side. So it'd be like a 333, five seconds off. Is that a good comparison, John? Yeah, I think breaking 333 and breaking four fl- flat, I would say they're roughly equivalent. So here's my question for you. Stefan Hassan has done it 16 times, most of women's history. How many times, folks, do you think like, I'm going to ask you both. Sebco broke 333 and how many times did Asbel Kiprop break 333. I don't think Sub Co did it very often. For Kiprop, I'm thinking like Sub 330, man. But I think, yeah, Sub 330 is a much better mark. So how many times for Sub Co and how many times for Kiprop? I'm going to go at least 20 for Kiprop. Wait, Kiprop was a doper. <laughs> now we're, now we're or convicted doper at least. And somehow I, I want to believe somehow he was framed. But yeah, um, I loved how that guy could run. But he's a nice doper. We like him. Uh, He's a sk- super skinny doper who gave us the belief that people were clean. I don't really like dopers. I'll say that. Once you break bread with him, John, I had I broke bread with with Kip Rop at Kip Kano's house after the World Junior Cross Country in 2007 when he was a nothing. And then once you see him go on to his career, you know, like, hey, your friends are always clean. Uh, although I, I had no friendship with him. But sounds like you did. Okay, I'm going to go 20 and five. Yeah, I'll say three and. 21 just to be an asshole i think because i think sebco ran most he ran a lot of miles as well that's why i'm saying low if you add in all these miles because the men run the mile a lot the women don't run it very often right what are our answers we have a winner well we have a winner assuming we're not following the prices right rules well the wins 24 for kipper up well i won on that one i said 21 i know he's one off Weldon's closer he said 20 he said 25 you did yes i said 20 Thank you, Robert, for defending me, but I said yeah, 20. Yeah, Robert's just <laughs> making stuff up so that Weldon wins. In my mind, he said 25. And then Sebco has done it nine times. Now, if you threw in the miles, it'd be way over 30, I would think. Anyways, interesting stuff. So where do we go next? I guess speaking about the 1500, when we, we had the Oslo Dream Mile last week, and when we were writing the preview for the race, like with the top Kenyans got not in that race, Manangoa and Chariot, it was really hard to predict. Like we were wondering if Jacob Ingebrigtsen would win the first hometown guy to win the Dream Mile, and then I changed our prediction to no, he won't win. I thought the field had a better chance, but I I was like, I don't have confidence in anyone in this field. Like no one is that good anymore, and that's what we ended the race being. It was like a three fifty two race, but somebody had to win it, and it ended up being Marcin Lewandowski. So hometown dream was denied. I think you got to give some respect to Marcin Lewandowski, though. This guy, he was a really good 800 runner, but not he never medaled at Worlds. And he switched to the 1500 a few years ago. He got seventh in at Worlds in, in 2017. And then he got medaled at World Indoors last year. He got the silver. And they beat Jakob Ingebrigtsen in the 1500 Euro Indoors this year. And now he's won the Dream Mile. I think this guy, he's a serious medal contender. I mean, he's got he's still got a lot of speed because of his 800 background. And especially if he's there with 100 meters to go, I mean, you don't want to be anywhere near this guy. You want to have, you want to be like Chariot and Manigoy and just like dropping him before then, because if he's still around, he's a, he's a big time metal threat. So I think especially if it goes tactical in Doha, which my guess is Chariot won't want that to happen. But if it does look out for this guy. I think he's a different type of runner than Jenny Simpson, but I think sort of the scenarios Johns were playing out hold true if it's a really fast race at worlds Lewandowski you know maybe can sneak on for a bronze similar to Simpson but if it's a 330 race which is that's has that ever happened at a championship you know it's he's not going to get a medal or I mean he's not going to be up there contending for the win Ikemel El Garouge ran 327 in the world championship final once wow and but also John the the, the scenario of one more comment on his, uh, his son, or Dababa. You're like, oh, 355, it's, uh, she's unbeatable. She almost got beat this week in a 355 race. So 
I think I don't like how we kind of preordain the races at times. Hassan said she could stick with her. I think a little more Laura Muir could stick with her. So I'm looking really looking forward to Worlds. Yeah, that's a fair point. I think my my bigger point, I should say, I didn't think Simpson could could beat her in that race, but I, I do agree. Yeah, Laura Muir's around 355s. Hassan, we don't know if she'll be in the event, but that, that's a good point. Well done. Considering some of the names that have just been mentioned, I don't want to be too specific, but imagine some of these people, if this microdose EPO test comes back and you can backdate it, oh my God, people must be nervous. Now, does that, do we have a 10 year statute of limitations? I think they go back 15 years and just announce the positives, but just don't ban them. We could just wipe out tired, tired generation of runners. So, um, well, I think John's singing the praises of Lewandowski because. John saw him this weekend. Didn't he fly from Oslo to the, I think he was at the Adidas meet. John, you went to two meets this weekend. You went to the Adrian Martinez Classic and the Adidas Boost Games. I didn't watch either one of them. Just sort of, I don't know. The Adidas Boost Games is on NBC, I believe, or NBCSN. It was on NBC. And my question to you guys about this meet is, does anyone care about this meet? Like, I... I consider myself a very big track fan. I was at the meet. It's in Boston. I'm going to go. You guys, I think you're pretty big track fans, I would say. You were on a popular running website. I know you were out of town, but like, if this thing was on TV as a fan, would you just turn it on and watch the street meet in Boston? Are you interested in it? Does it move the needle? Do you care about this meet? Well, I cared about it because it was on NBC, so I think it's good. Like A kid at home might be flipping the channel, although so many things are now on apps, but and see it so the more tv on nbc the more excited i am as a professional journalist i would rather see it be a diamond league meet because i I just don't like basically are all the competitors adidas athletes john is there anyone that's not from adidas there very few non-adidas athletes and the the other thing is a lot of these sprint events they just put they will put the top adidas athlete and noah lyles you're gonna have very few people in the world who are going to challenge noah lyles and anything above 100 meters but most of these races, it's just a coronation for Noah Lyles or Shawnee Miller Weibo, just a showcase for those those kind of athletes. Yeah, so exhibitions like that kind of. Yeah, I view it more as sort of a, as an exhibition thing. And no, this weekend I was at my parents' fiftieth wedding anniversary, and it was Sunday. And real quickly, I pulled up the Rabat meet and was trying to get results there. The Adidas stuff. Do people care about it? No, but does anyone care about any of these things? Being, to begin with. But could it be packaged on TV and be something that people watch and is sort of beneficial from the sport? Well, clearly, people think the answer is yes, because that's what's being done. And Robert said he'd rather see a Diamond League. This meet pretty much just replaced – Adidas used to pretty much sponsor, I think, the Diamond League meet in New York, which sadly no one really supported – people didn't go to. I mean, we lost the only Diamond League meet in New York. It went away. And then I assume Adidas sort of shifted some resources to this meet and they can get, you know, hundred percent branding feature their athletes. It's more of an exhibition, but I think like this year they changed some of the stuff around. Some of the distance stuff was on TV in the streets. I don't know. I, I didn't watch a single second of it. I, you know, granted I had other stuff, but I think that shows when you have limited time, what do you watch? The robot stuff though was not on any TV. It was on Olympic channel tape delayed. So I think sort of, you know, everyone in America, the one meet they get to really watch is the Prefontaine Classic. They get Worlds, they get the Diamond League Finals. That's what's on network TV. You get USAs, and but you also get this Adidas Boost game. So hopefully it was entertaining for people who watched it. Yeah, I like how they combined the distance events into the street meet this year. Um, and I found a lot of John's interviews to be interesting. I mean, Adidas does have a lot. I didn't realize this. They pay a lot of high schoolers and a lot of college people to go pro early. I mean, whether it's Drew Hunter, Noah Lyles, Sammy Watson, they, they just don't mind doing that. Um, I, I, I am a big fan. I, I wish that the NCA for all sports would say you either go pro out of high school or you stay for three years. I don't like this one and done thing in any sport. It bothers me less in track than it does in, in like basketball. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely some interesting names there. Yeah, and I I do think it, this used to be a two day meet. They would have the distance meet events on either a Friday or Saturday, and then they would have the straight sprints uh, on Boston Common on Sunday. I think they made two changes this year, which I really liked. One was getting rid of the track events and just moving them to the road because 
Last year, I mean, the weather was terrible last year, so can't totally fault them. But that meet, just the distance night was not particularly well supported. It wasn't a great atmosphere. So moving them to the street and having them finish on this elevated track and have them run up the ramp to get onto the finish of the elevated track is a 200-meter elevated track on Boylston Street by the Boston Marathon finish line. I thought that was really cool, and the distance races had some good finishes, especially the mile with Lewandowski and Drew Hunter and Chris O'Hare and Eric Avila battling it out. So I thought that was a good change. The other change was just the change of location. The track seemed to be pretty fast this year. Like I remember the first year of this meet, Johan Blake was complaining and saying the track was atrocious and that he was, you know, he he was saying he was considering intentionally full starting because he was worried he was going to get hurt. And this year, I mean, Akani Simbine ran 992 in the 100, which is only 0.03 off his PR on that track. I thought that the surface just seemed to be a lot better this year. Even though it was wet, it was sort of there were some pools of water which they were trying to like blow away with uh, with leaf blowers uh, after the finish line. But I thought the track was better quality, so I do think those are two changes for the better this time. My only concern about the meet is, folks, will Jonathan Gall be allowed back next year? Jonathan was pulling. John, we haven't talked about Jonathan's big week, folks. Jonathan's written a five thousand word feature article on the shot put Michael Carter's high school shot put record turning forty. The boards are full of praise. Jonathan Gall should be commended. When a writer leaves you hanging on every word, it's excellent stuff. So, John, you're at the peak of your praise on the message board, although people are accusing me of deleting negative posts on there. I don't remember doing that. Someone says there is zero to be critical about that outstanding article. Could it be they deleted it because you were being a drunk a-hole? So, John, if I did delete it, I probably only deleted a drunk a-hole. But John's getting the praise there, but... I heard John was being, maybe it got to John's head, even though he hadn't published the article yet, but John knew that he was up for big praise. At Adidas meet, he was asking the hard the hard questions. John was trying to figure out why Tory Bowie left the training camp last year after an alleged fight with... Um, Shawnee Miller-Webo. Shawnee Miller-Webo. And also was asking the, 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 new, the new pros, Sammy Watson and Irby, why they went pro early and when they did. And John, were you getting some pushback because you were really being journalist, or how did that work out? Well, yeah, so three different interviews there. Let's start with, we can get to Bowie in a minute, but I spoke to Sammy Watson and Lena Irby because them when they turned pro, those were two of the most surprising decisions I can remember in recent memory in terms of athletes turning pro, just because the timing was so weird. Sammy Watson, for those who don't remember, she was the 2016 World Junior Champion in the 800 meters. She was the NCAA champion at 800 meters last year as a true freshman at Texas A&M. She runs one eight hundred indoors this year. Runs two oh six, which is a huge backslide from what she was running last year. Her PR is too flat as a high school senior in twenty seventeen. She made the USA final, and then she turns pro. And I think everyone's just like, "What? Like, why? Why now?" Her value was way higher in June twenty eighteen. She's now not running as well when she's older, and she just turns pro. So that was very odd. And Lena Irby. Same thing. Like she ran 49.8 last year to win NCAAs in the 800 as a true freshman. That's phenomenal. It was the number five time in the world last year. She was a huge future star. And then this year, indoors, she doesn't break 52 seconds in the 400 or 23 seconds in the 200. She did that in every single indoor race she ran in 2018. She still won SECs. I mean, it's not like she's running awful. And she was fourth at NCAAs. But then she runs two meets outdoors for Georgia and turns pro. And just really, really strange decisions on both of their parts, I think. And so I asked them, you know, why did you turn pro when you did? And Lena Irby wouldn't give me anything. She would just say it was the right time to go. That's basically all she told me. She wasn't worried. She's like, look, I'm not trying to run 49 seconds now. I'm trying to run it later in the season. She was trying to play it off as if everything was fine, that she didn't have any regrets even though she said she didn't regret going pro in June 2018 when her value would have been much higher than it was in April 2019. But yeah, she wouldn't really open up. Sammy Watson was more expansive. She was essentially telling me she wasn't very happy with her with the coaching she was getting and just her training environment in general. She said the transition, Elaine Francique left as a Texas A&M coach in the middle of the 2018 indoor season. Sammy Watson did win NCAAs outdoors that year. But she just said that she didn't really think the transition was going that well. She wanted to be pushed more often in practice. 
which I mean, she was training with a woman who just won the NCAA title, Jasmine Frey, but she said she wanted to be pushed more and she's planning on joining Derek Thompson's group in Philadelphia with Ajay Will Ajay Wilson and uh, Raven Rogers. But she also said she thought the timing was perfect for when she turned pro, even though right now she's stranded in College Station, Texas, waiting out till her lease expires so she can move to Philadelphia. So that just sounds like complete hogwash that the timing was perfect. I mean, no. Both of these people, both of these women, the timing was strange. No one would just decide. Their plan would not be, all right, I'm going to come back for my sophomore season, and then midway through the year, I'm just going to turn pro. I don't think anyone would plan that. So to say the timing was perfect was crazy, but I don't know. What is your take on this, guys? Well, I mean, I I don't know. To me, it didn't bother me. Yeah, I don't think – I agree with you. I don't think the timing is perfect, but there could be things behind the scene. Maybe they're having academic problems. Maybe there's a discipline problem. I, 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 I'm totally speculating here, but I, I can kind of see – there also could be panic. Maybe you think, oh, my, my gosh, I'm not running well. My, my money opportunities are going to be gone. I guess at that young, you don't think you're never going to be good anymore. I mean, these people probably think it's all in their head. But to me, as I said, I, I wouldn't have paid Watson. I mean, she was – the more concerning thing for her with me is unless she's really injured. I mean, she, she was splitting. I, I looked it up. She split 55 seconds in the 4 by 4 this year for Texas A&M. I mean, this is a woman that used to run 52 open, like in 2015. Now she's running 55. Like, th- there's not a lot of coaching and training involved in losing that much speed. So that's very concerning. I mean, yes, if she joins, you know, Thompson's group, like if anyone could turn around, it would be him. But I don't know. That's just concerning to me. And and now I'm disturbed by the fact that, she, I mean, she doesn't want to move to Philadelphia because she has a lease. So she doesn't have enough money that she can break a lease. And, and spend an extra thousand dollars a month or whatever it is to get a new apartment in Philadelphia. Like, I, I don't know. I was really hoping. I mean, I, I assuming when she was a world junior champion, she had significant offers. Like, I don't know. Like, I hope that she got paid enough that she can afford to break a lease and still go to college because I don't see this ending well for her at all in terms of the running. So anyways, wish her the best, but I, it's just, I, I'd be curious to know how much money that, you know, they gave up by going pro now versus six months ago. But I think from Adidas thinking, these are some of the most talented, you know, 400, 800 meter young runners in America ever. So it's like, Hey, they have a blip for six months, especially Urbe. I think she's dropped off the least, but Hey, you know, it's like, it's an option. If, if it pans out, you got them early, you're going to have them their whole careers. If not, you know, it sounds like clearly they're, at least in Watson's case, they're not putting that much money. But yeah, if she needs to break a lease just for a few months, I mean, wh- what are we talking about? Like five thousand dollars or something? I think Adidas would be would just be like, hey, no, get out of there. You want to go train in go train in New Jersey? Go train in New Jersey. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, I view this this is just a buy low opportunity for Adidas. You know, I, who knows? I don't know how long these contracts would be, but. Like Lena Irby, she ran forty nine seconds a year ago. She's clearly she's clearly still very very talented, and I have much more faith that she would be able to turn things around than than Watson. But for them, I, I don't think there's that much risk for Adidas. You're putting some money into some people who might turn out to be big talents. I think the risk is much more on the athletes who I don't know if they're in school anymore or what they're doing. But th- that's just a riskier decision for me turning pro at nineteen or twenty when you're not running that well than Adidas taking on when your value is low. I mean, with Irby, we got to forget how talented she is, John. I mean, last year you could argue she should get more than Sidney McLaughlin, that she's a better 400-meter runner than Sidney McLaughlin. So I, I don't think – I'm assuming she got significant money to go pro early. I mean, just because she has a couple races that aren't NCA record. It was an entire season, well then. It wasn't a couple races, but I, I, your point – I understand your point. But I think this also reflects on Sydney McLaughlin. The insane thing about her is we have these ridiculous expectations for her. And the reason why she's so valuable is she just keeps improving and getting better and better and doing everything like NCAA record last year. She was the world leader last year as a freshman in college. She won her first Diamond League this this week or last week in Oslo, defeating the Olympic champion and world leader, Dalil Muhammad. I mean, the crazy thing about McLaughlin is it's it's usual you see you don't normally see people at that high level continue to improve year after year and she's done it so i think that's what's the really remarkable thing about sydney mclaughlin when you compare it to Irby. if you look at Irby, she ran 50.8 last year at ncas and this year 52.3 so it's a second and a half i mean maybe she's just like screw it i'm not doing well anymore but interesting stuff but guys let's move on 
we have our email of the week. Well, then, please share it. Moving back to the high school ranks. Well, this is also related to the threads of the week, so we'll combine things here. The top, top two threads last week. And this actually ties into what we were talking about, sort of, of how difficult it can be for female stars in their teenage years to continue that into their 20s. Yeah, so the, these top two th- threads of the week, uh, most popular threads on Let's Run, are somewhat related, somewhat related to this. One's re- specifically related to the email of the week. So one thread is Ali O speaks out against ESPN's commentating, and the other thread is Caitlin Tui's season is over. Let's talk about that second one first. Caitlin Tui, the high school phenom of the last two years, essentially ended the season after the state meet in New York, didn't go to any of the postseason meets, and people are sort of speculating, you know, what that means. She's still, you know, if not the top, the number two, number three high school runner in America. So people are reading maybe, I think, too much into that. But there was this huge thread. People were discussing, you know, like, oh, is she tailing off? Is her body changing? That sort of stuff. And there's a lot of contentious issues with that. People are like, delete this thread. It shouldn't be talked about. Some people say inappropriate comments. But I think it's a topic that needs to be discussed. It's just because you're a high school phenom in ninth grade doesn't mean you're being a high school phenom as a senior. And Tui's already a junior, and so she did really well her sophomore and junior years. So that it's a little more nuanced, but – The email of the week is totally related to this. Okay, guys, email of the week. Actually, before I read it, I have a question for you guys. I want you to tell me of this year's senior girls high school class, of the girls who as freshmen were top 10 in their class in the mile in 1600, how many of of that top 10 are still in the top 10 now? How many of the freshmen from four years ago are in the, the top 10 fastest freshmen are in the top 10 now? Top 10 of seniors, yeah. For women. Top 10 of senior class. For women. Zero. They don't have to be top 10 overall. It's top 10 overall. Top 10 as Zero freshman like class, it. top 10 senior class. I'll, I'll say two. Wow. Very good, guys. Yes. None. I'll read the email. It's from Justin. So I'm not sure if he wants his name out there, but if he does, we'll give him full credit next week. Weldon, I want to commend you for regulating the Kate Lentuli thread. I think a lot of good can come from this thread, and I also think it would be great to see Let's Run put together an article asking some of the best athletes, coaches, doctors, personal trainers, and exercise scientists what should be done through training in order to help girls continue to improve regardless of their weight. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. For this year's senior class, none of the top 10 in the nation as freshmen for the 1600 slash mile are in the top 10 now for the senior class. Okay, here you go. Here's some more stuff, guys. Only four of them ran faster than their freshman times. Three of them ran about the same, but a little slower. And three of them ran 10 to 22 seconds slower. Their average ranking within a class as a freshman was 5.5. And now it's 170.8. Seven of the top 10 had an average of 27.1. And three of them had an average of 506. So three of them really tailed off. So then he goes on and he's got, you know, all these questions Asking people, you know, what's your progression from middle school to senior? How many miles are you working? That sort of stuff. And I think one would be like, you know, how can we help people continue to improve? Another thing would just be to sort of also get it out there. Just because you're a phenom as a freshman, it doesn't mean you're going to be a phenom as a senior on the women's side and sort of reset expectations and get, you know, how do you discuss with a kid? hey, you know, you're still a great athlete, you're a great person, your wealth isn't tied into your running, but just because you're not running as fast, here's some things you can do to keep running fast. I and mean, there's just so much related to that. Well, I, I, I personally don't think there's a lot that can be done. I just think it's their body is changing. They're becoming women. I mean, I think that there's a reason why th- this actually ties into the transgender and the, and the intersex debate to me. I mean, there's a reason why women are significantly slower than men. And some of those body changes just aren't conducive to fast running. So uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I almost feel like I haven't been, I was never hyping Tui this year because I, I, I'm just not going to hype a sophomore girl in, in high school. Um, you know, the same person to me that, that, that said to me, you know, three or four years ago that Grant Fisher wasn't the best boy in, in Michigan that said that Donovan Brazier was also said to me this fall, he's like, I don't think Caitlin Tui is going to be the best girl in a couple of years. And his, his pick was this girl Starliper from, from Pennsylvania 
But I mean, look at Sydney Mascarelli. I mean, I think she won the 5,000 right at the New Balance and Nationals outdoors last year and the two mile. I mean, to me, what a, what a super talent. She's running 16 lows for 5,000. She doesn't even run in the winter. So she plays basketball and averages like 16, 17 points a game. I mean, she won foot lockers in the fall. So Tui won NXN was the better athlete in the fall, but, but Mascarelli was no chump change. I mean, she won foot lockers and then she plays basketball and then it's still so good. So I, I don't think you need to train you around at, at, at that age really, but I don't think that like her lack of training is, is the reason why she's going to be improving. I just think that she's obviously, it's just a, it's a body issue. And I also, I'm not writing Tui off completely. I mean, they said she had some allergies that could have ex- explained some of this. Um, you know, so it's just a, a difficult thing for anyone involved. I was thinking about that though myself. Like if I had a phenom that if, I, if my daughter was really good, like do you let them run a lot in eighth and ninth grade? Cause you know, they could change and not going to be any better. Or, or do you say like, well, I don't want to give their hopes up. So I just don't have them train very much because they're probably going to slow down anyway. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Like, you know, do you train really hard or not? Well, I want to also say I'm, I'm impressed by how the coaching staff at, Caitlin Tui's high school, North Rockland High School, has handled her this year. I mean, I think shutting her down, if she's not ready to roll and she's not feeling 100% or she's fatigued, she's been racing a lot this year, I think it's smart. Don't don't kowtow to pressure to have her run. She was supposed to run the Adrian Martinez Classic last week in Boston, and she chose not to do that, and she chose not to run these postseason invitationals. I mean, I think I think that's fine. Like, if you think she's getting tired, shut her down. She had a great so- junior year. Bring her back next year and have it ready to go. I, I think I just want to give a shout out to them. I think they've managed her expectations and just not putting too much on her plate. I think they've done a very good job with that. You're just talking to a few people now living in New York. I've only heard good things about that group. And I think, you know, now like people are just making too much of them shutting down her season. I expect her to come back next year and be, be one of the, you know, I guess, I guess if you're number five instead of number one, that is a big drop off from where she was. So, but I, you know, right now it's just like, okay, so she just didn't run a few postseason meets. That doesn't mean it wasn't a successful season. Doesn't mean the end of the world for her. Um, but there's a lot of issues and that I think need to be discussed. And so some people, I think the solution, this is just sort of like the let's run forums in general, like, Nope, no discussion. We, we don't want to let here stuff that's uncomfortable. And maybe that's oversimplifying a bit. And other people are like, no, you just need to moderate it better and that sort of stuff. And, we're not perfect. Moderating is way more art than science, but I think there's important discussions that need to be had here. And, you know, at the sort of related to this, okay, Rosen Willis, she's the freshman who beat a thing Mo at New Balance indoors. She's 14 years old only. She won the Brooks PR 800 um, in 204.86 this weekend. Her mom was a professional runner Olympian for Ireland. So what, Robert, she's your daughter. You're just going to tell her not to run or not try to do well because she's 14 and she's running well. I mean, like, what do you do there? I think because her mother was an Olympian, I would would think that she's likely to have the body changes are unlikely to hurt her to the same extent they often do some of these teenage phenoms. But no, I, I think that that's great. I mean, if you look at the woman who has the age 14 world record, it's actually Mary Decker, 202.43. Now, Mary did um, get pops later, about 20 years later, for some PEDs. What does that have to do with when she was 14 years old? I'm just saying that I, I'm saying that there's no doubt that Mary Slaney was a very talented runner. I, I, I don't think she was probably on PEDs at age 14. Um, so I, I think that I just want to point out just because you have success at an early age doesn't rule out future success, but it also doesn't guarantee it. Um, so, but I, I would be more optimistic, you know, it's like if you're Ken Griffey or Ken Griffey Jr., I mean, it, like, what are they likely to develop into? To me, as a former coach, running is, is an, one of the biggest questions, and this applies to men and women, but the real question to me is when do you stop improving? I mean, most people improve a lot up until like kind of the end of their college careers. And then it sort of starts to stagnate well, in the middle of their college careers, maybe. And then once they start training at a high level, it's much more incremental. And then some people don't even really improve much at all, you know, after like 23 or 24. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, Nick Willis, I think he ran his PR at like 30, but it's not, he's not running that much faster than he was, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. 
But you know, one of the things with Weldon was Weldon kept improving. You know, was running his PR at like twenty seven or twenty eight. You know, so it, it's just really when do you stagnate? When when do you stop improving? All runners are going to experience that, and it, it's just sometimes when you're younger, you're taking off ten seconds a year per mile, which is really exciting, and then it's well, I'll never take off ten seconds the rest of my career. Okay, let's turn to the thread of the week, which is this thread. Alio speaks out on ESPN's commentating, and Ali Ostrander, the NCA steeplechase champion, posted on Instagram this post. I would like to proceed this rant by saying that I'm incredibly grateful for the equal coverage that ESPN provided for both the men's and women's NCA track and field championships. This is often not the case, as 40% of athletes are females, but they only receive 4% of sports media coverage. With that said, I was disappointed with the commentary that has occurred during my races for the past two years. Both times, the comments have brought attention to my appearance more than my ability. In 2018, I was called a baby-faced assassin and told that I look like I still play with Barbies. This year, the commentators found it necessary to state, incorrectly, I might add, my height and weight multiple times. Not only were these comments objectifying and unnecessary, they drew attention away from the real focus of the event. People attend this event and listen to commentary because they want to see what we're capable of, not what we look like, not what we look like we're capable of. And it goes on. This thread got a lot of discussion on Let's Run. Um, some of it was sort of factual, people pointing out some of the comments were said over the PA system, not on the broadcast, that sort of stuff. Um, I don't, I'm not sure even where to begin with this. Uh, the baby face assassin, you know, the, the term disguise describes a lot of male athletes. I think if you look young, people are going to discuss that. So I'll just begin there saying that I think that's totally fair game. Um, I'm sure if you're Ali, like I looked like I was 12 when I got my driver's license. I hated it. I remember pulling up to a, I was about five, five and driving. And I, I pulled up at this stoplight next to this lady and she started banging on the window. Like, how old are you? mouthing how old are you and i was so pissed and embarrassed and i i did a five with one hand and another five and then another five and then a middle finger i apologize to that lady but i hated it like people thinking i was 12 years old walton says he did that i did that see this is the problem one of us did it but we both think it was me well i'm taking credit for him i'm apologizing for sins that aren't even mine Sins of the brother. That sounds more like something Robert would do, just uh, impartial observer here, but I, I don't know for sure. Thank you, John. Thank you. I was trying to cover from Robert for his hostile actions, road rage. I mean, when I saw the threat, first of all, I, I thought, I, I didn't watch the broadcast. We, we were at the meet. So I was thinking about it, and I think it's interesting. I'm glad that women are willing to stand up for themselves. They should not be objectified. But... I, I I thought about it, first of all, from my former broadcasting standpoint. I'm like, if they spend a lot of time on her appearance, it just reiterates my fact they need to have a distance analyst on the thing. And ESPN, you have my phone number, 844-538-7786, 844-LET'S-RUN. Call me up. We can negotiate. But um, I, I thought, like, they must just not have anything. It's hard for them to fill the 10 minutes of time, and they're talking about something they don't need to be talking about. I mean, I would not be talking uh, – while I think a woman's – weight or men's weight too is important to their performance i would never talk about that at length probably not even at all on a broadcast it's just not really relevant once the race starts so but her looking young i mean baby face assassin to me is innocent steph curry is the baby face assassin turner's to bob is the baby face assassin that's not a male female she looks young i mean now the barbie dolls comment seems a little bit stereotypical to me but i the height and the weight i, I would really espn has issued a statement saying we didn't say that so apparently mike J, the NCAA announcer said it but he is such a professional and so good. And I asked John, I, I really, I'm trying to find out what did he actually say? I can only think of him saying something like Ali Ostrander, all five foot two and 105 pounds ever. I, I, I can't imagine that he would really be focusing on that. John? Honestly, I, d- I don't recall. I don't, th- yeah, I don't think it's necessary to be talking about her weight. I think people can see Ali Ostrander is small. I don't think we really need to, it's just a touchy subject. I don't think we need to be going into it on a broadcast or in, in stadium announcing, but I don't remember. They, he's, Mike J probably said a thousand things that week. I don't remember every single one of them. Ali obviously did. It struck a chord with her. So kudos to her for speaking out for what she you know, felt made her feel uncomfortable. I think it's great that she spoke out just to have people in the future be more, more cautious about what they say. And that's good. 
but I, I, it's kind of hard to, to to go into this when we don't. No one really needs. I mean, factually knows exactly what was said. Right. It sounds like the Barbie comment might have been last year in ESPN, which I think you know that that is totally unnecessary. The whole weight and issue thing. It's kind of back to the toy thread. Like with a male athlete, you might discuss their weight, but I think the eating issues and men have eating issues as well. It's just unless it's really relevant, don't mention the weight. Like somebody on this toy thread posted the weights and this could be completely made up. I mean, weights change, right. Of like the 5k Olympic champions and their heights. And I just, I, I, the way the thread was going, I made the thread registered users only to post cleaned it up. And I actually deleted that thread. It's like a factual thing, but they were, it became so heated. I actually decided, I just was like, no, this thread is not, I don't want people discussing the actual weight of people because we're discussing Caitlin Tooley and why she shut down the season. And I don't think much of its I mean, may, weight may factor in there or something, but it's, we're discussing her, not this issue in general. And I don't want, you don't want people just to read it and think, Oh, that's a weight I have to get to because, you know, obviously these, a lot of them are very short. So it's just a kind of fraught issue. Wait, the thread's not deleted. No, the thread's still there. I deleted that actual one post. It just About had, the Olympic 5,000 champions weight. Yeah, it sounds crazy, but the way the thread was going and uh, this guy was posting other stuff and it was just a bunch of posts and uh, removing that one kind of factored into some of the replies and this other stuff. It was just going off off course. Now in retrospect saying it, I'm like, wait, I probably shouldn't have removed it because it's a factual thing and people should be able to discuss these things and have some con- some context. But just the way it was done was, I felt like not healthy and I see how people criticize moderating decisions all the time. And I thought one thing from Alio pointing out, well, she said 40% of athletes are women. I'm not sure what that, what level that is or whatever, but they only get 4% of the coverage. And that sort of brings us into the women's soccer team and the world cup, equal pay, the goal celebrations, which I think we talked about a little bit last week. Um, you know, some interesting topics. I, I, you, one may be able to soon make the argument that the women should get paid more than the men in soccer. They're bringing in more television. Well, not worldwide, U.S. women. Right, no, the U.S. women. Obviously not worldwide, but then it's like, okay, so do we help out the Thai women who, you know, soccer's not, women's Thai soccer, I assume, isn't that popular. Maybe it is because they made the World Cup, but or the Jamaican women, essentially Bob Marley's daughters floating the team, a lot of the team's cost. But, in the U.S., you could make the argument maybe soon that the women should get paid more than the men. And I'd be fine with that if they're bringing in more money. Yeah, that's always been my thing. Because I think you've seen a lot of numbers thrown out by each side saying, oh, this is why it's justified to pay them less. And, oh, this is why they need to be paid more. I, I have yet to see the definitive article on this subject saying, here's actually how much the U.S. women's national team brings in compared to the men. Um, I would love to read it at some point. And I, I think you see uh, on these debates, you see a lot of stupid arguments. John and I were talking about this. They're like, oh, the U.S. women scored 13 goals. The men haven't scored 13 goals in so many years. That doesn't have anything to do with it. It's talking about revenue. Even in this Castor Semenya case and the whole document's out, apparently Ross Tucker, who I respect a great deal, he argued on Semenya's behalf and he said, look, she's not as dominant as, as Usain Bolt. That has nothing to do with it. I don't care how dominant CC Telfer is. It's, if you're a man, you should not be in the women's category in my opinion period i don't care if you're the best or the worst now caster to me is, is truly, biological man or you mean biologically would you do you yeah. think she should be allowed to compete on so when she presses her testosterone because that's not going to change her gen, her, that's not going to change if, her biological if you're menu, i think you're intersex and, and i still think you shouldn't be allowed to compete um what about what about cc telfer under testosterone suppressment you just said a man so i think you mean a biological male so she should never be allowed to compete. Correct. Like, you just need to be carefully clear. Okay, fine. That's a different. Uh, yeah. If, if if I was trying not to go into this thing, as I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, I was so upset about this. In case you missed it, CC Telfer made the media round. She was on the ESPN show, and and she said at one point they asked her, you know, some people say you have an advantage. She said, if anything, I think I have a disadvantage because I'm on I'm on testosterone, you know, uh, suppressing medication, and that just so upset me. I was like, look, she has years of strength that the most women never have. Um, you know, that's, she has, she's losing strength, but she had strength that they never had. And if we're talking about anniversaries, folks, we're now today is three weeks since the NCAA refuses to confirm to me that there is absolutely 
no minimum T level. We're pretty sure this is the case. There's no minimum T level. The maximum T level that you can have as a woman. And there's no independent verification that you're actually lowering your T level. So the NCA's rule is you have to have basically it appears to be a doctor's note saying that you're on testosterone suppression for one year. But it doesn't matter what level. I mean, are you taking one birth control pill a month? Are you taking it once every six months or daily like Castor Semenya? So you do that for one year, you're good to go. So you could do that your freshman year, sounds like, and then just, hey, most of these people are keeping their their penis and they're and they're they're not having surgery to be removed. So you could do that your freshman year. Then you're eligible to compete as a woman. And then yes, it's gonna take you a while for your testosterone to come back up, but you could do that years two, three, and four. You're on no testosterone replacement replacement therapy and totally dominate. Now that's not what Cece did in this case. I'm not saying she's doing, but these rules are absolutely absurd. I mean, it's so ridiculous. I mean, it sounds like you're against a transgender athlete being allowed to compete at the highest level, even on testosterone replacement. And I feel like as a society, we've had, like most people are, want to support that. I, I understand your opinion. I'm not sure exactly where I am, but I don't have a problem with your opinion there. But it just show that the NCA needs strict guidelines if they're going to allow it, because I think it is a totally unfair advantage. If someone were to go on suppressment therapy for a year and then get off of it, and then the year way back still counted, I assume the rule meant you have to have at the time of whatever event you're competing in, you have to have been undergone gone the therapy for a year. Well, I'm I'm definitely opposed with no limits. I, I would like to see more science on the limits. I mean, one of the things, and I haven't gotten through the whole 160-page report, but Amy Burford has sort of summarized it for me. We may publish this soon. Is apparently Castor Semenya was on testosterone suppressing medication when she won the Olympics in 2012. So if you don't reduce it to a certain level, it doesn't really impact you that much. I mean, she was still dominant in 2012. So, um, I mean, yeah. It, the, the problem is we're just never going to know at what level is it quote unquote fair. And I would argue that it, it, it I, I don't know. I'd say it's never fair. Like if you're seven feet tall in basketball, that's going to be an advantage, whether you're have high testosterone or not. I mean, that's just going to be a huge advantage. She see is six feet, two inches tall. That helps her a lot in the hurdles in terms of getting over them. Right. Well, he, here is the problem as I see it. Whether it's someone who has a DSD like Casta Semenya, or if it's someone who is a transgender like CC Telfer, if one of these women wins a world title, obviously CC is a long way from that, but Castor is not. If they're on, t- if say Castor takes the testosterone lowering medication and then comes back and wins the world title next year, oh, sorry, wins the Olympic title next year, that's still going to be a huge issue. It, people aren't going to be okay with that. The people who su- said that she should be on this med- medication and she gets on the medication and she still wins, they're still going to be upset. They're going to say this rule needs to be changed because it's clear she still has an advantage. Same with if some transgender, um, male to female transgender, gets the Olympics and wins the gold medal. Everyone's going to say she won this gold medal because she's transgender, because she was biologically male. They, I don't think there's ever a great, there's not going to be a great solution because if you impose these limits, yes, the, the athletes may meet them, but. If they get too good, there's going to be public outroar again, which makes it just really an incredibly complicated situation. And it is interesting. I feel like this came out, I think, yesterday that, um, you know, the, the caster, I feel like a, uh, her case, if the transgen- in, is, transgender issue wasn't going on simultaneously, I think caster might have it a little bit easier. And in some of the stuff yesterday, she accused the IWF of using um, her case to attempt to impose quote, a shadow transgender rule. So I think the transgender issue, if that wasn't there, the IWF might say, Hey, this is a very limited case. We've only seen a few athletes who's, who have this. They seem to be concentrated in the 400 and 800, which for whatever reason seems to be the case with the intersex athletes. And so we'll just let it go or we won't have quite the stringent things. But I think the concern is there's a lot more people who identify as transgender, and then where do you draw the line then? So if you let it say like, hey, there's no testosterone cutoff, someone can say, I identify as a woman, I want to compete, no testosterone reduction at all. Essentially, I'm a biologically male, and I want to compete. I've al- I've always argued that. The whole tr- the rise of transgender acceptance has definitely hurt Castro's dominion. I mean, because we're letting people in society, and I'm happy with this. I mean, CC as a person has really thrived in the last year, and it's fantastic to see her 
someone who's only going to practice once or twice a week now fully focused and training hard like that's great as a person and that was one of the things her coach said it's like she's really benefited from that so that's great that she's found this passion and this work ethic that she didn't have before but you know it's like if we're going to let people identify how however they want i mean it's not really relevant then whether cc has a penis or caster doesn't have a penis i mean to me it's sort of more like okay how are they how do they respond to testosterone how much testosterone do they have you know if we're going to self identify those are the things that we have to focus on but one of the interesting things to me was out of this IAAF report was um Danny Burfoot pointed this out to me there was an IAAF witness professor Angelika Hersenberg gynecologist from Sweden and she just recently completed a double blind randomized trial she gave 48 healthy young women either a testosterone cream or a placebo cream. Those receiving the tea cream increased their VO2 max by 8.5% and their anaerobic performance by 3.2%. And this is when their performance level was only increased to 4.3 nanomilliliters per liter. That's below the 5. So Semenya can still go to 5, even under the new rules. So, I mean, that's at 5. Imagine there's no limit for CC. She could be at 12. I mean, she... I mean, it's just the whole thing. Uh, let, let's talk about something else, though. We haven't talked about the teenage male sensation last week, Max Bergen, who set an age. Well, his first race as a 17-year-old, right? He ran 146 in Britain. John, you being half British, do you want to talk about him? Or do you guys want to end it with who would you rather be, Josh Kerr, Grant Fisher, or Drew Hunter? Yeah, I don't really have that much to, to add on Max Bergen. He ran 146 as a 17-year-old. He broke Steve Ovet's. British under 18 record, which was obviously very impressive. It'll be interesting to see how his career develops from here, but you know, it's off to a good start. I'm more interested in this question. Uh, the three athletes, Drew Hunter, Josh Kerr, Grant Fisher, I guess, Robert, do you want to lay out their credentials and then put the question to us? Wait, one comment about this under 17 record. Yeah. Who cares? I'm more interested in the, uh, I think it's the, uh, 18 and under record. Yes, yeah, so this is he. Max Bergen's what under 17? Under 18. He's 17. He just turned 17, right? Yes. So by the time he's 18, uh, he needs to be able to run 141.7. So um, <laughs> that's what Nigel Amos ran at the Olympics in 2012. Well, assuming he was actually 18 when he ran that time. Hell, even if he's 20. I mean, it just shows there's a long way to go. It's sort of interesting, you know, when you beat a famous runner's record. But I think with the men and the women, it shows if just because you're a phenom at 15, 17, 18 doesn't mean you be a phenom at 25. I wish them all luck. But I think the big thing everyone needs to remember is, like, enjoy it along the way. I mean, running, competing at a high level, it's such a privilege. It's such a wonderful opportunity. And whether you're just setting PRs, trying to PR, winning high school races, winning regional races, state championships, national records, whatever it is, try to enjoy it because you never know what's going to end. And it's supposed to be fun. You're supposed to learn from it. Okay, now let's go, Robert. Okay, as we were looking into Bergen, and there was a lot of, there was also Josh Kerr who won the NCAA 1500 meter title in 2017 and then went pro after his 2018 season. He ran very well at the Brooks PR meet, the same meet that the uh, 14-year-old woman girl was in. Um, he ran a 333 uh 60 last week to break i think it was another british guy's like under 23 record which john said didn't concern him but uh i don't think even the brits i don't i don't think even the brits don't care about the british under 23 record but he basically if you look at it kerr is similar in times to like greats like ovet and cram at that age maybe a little bit behind sepco i mean sepco was like a 140 Two one forty three eight hundred guy kind of moving up to the fifteen hundred later in his career, but I was like, wow, he's doing pretty well. And, and the interesting thing to me to realize is because this would have been cursed last year of college if he had come back. He's only twenty one, so he's young. He was born October eighth, nineteen ninety seven. That got me to thinking. I'm like, wow, like he's probably younger than Grant Fisher. Sure enough, he is. Grant Fisher, the American five thousand meter guy who won NCAs in 2016 in the 5,000, right? Or no, 2017. 2017. He was born April 22nd, 1997. And then Drew Hunter, who went pro and didn't go to college, the American 1,500, 5,000 guys, not sure what he's going to do. He was born 
September 5th, 1997. So basically Hunter and Kerr are the exact same age. They're within one month of each other. And then Fisher is, you know, April, about five or six months older than them. So they're basically all similar ages. And I was thinking if you're a shoe executive or if you could go back in time and be one of these runners, let's say, I, I think if you're the shoe executive might be the better analogy, which one would you sign? If you could sign them right now, which one of these three is going to have the better career moving forward? The, the case for Hunter, he's running the 1500. He ran 335.9 last year. That's similar to what Kerr ran last year. Kerr ran 335.99 in 2017 and 335.01 last year. So Kerr was a little bit faster um, and now 333.60. But Hunter has run 313.21 for 5,000 just recently. Or you, Grant Fisher, he has a 339 PB for the 1500. Um, his 5,000 PR is 1329 from this year, which he won that race. He did run 1337 back in 2017, if you're looking for the progression. So, John, your shoe was that you can sign one of these three, only one. Which one do you sign? Well, I mean, are we t- figuring in nationality to this one, though? Like, Kerr is British and Hunter and Fisher are American. Like, obviously, they're more marketable in America than Kerr is, but... Who's more likely to win a world championship or an Olympic medal? I mean, to me, it's it's fairly easy. It's Josh Kerr. Uh, I think they're all great runners, but Josh Kerr. All right, let's. Here's a reminder. Here's what he did in 2017. When he was 19 years old. He won the NCAA indoor and outdoor title. He beat Edward Cheserek, who had just run 352, set the collegiate record. He beat him to win NCAA indoors. Then he makes the British team for the World Championships when he's 19. He beat. You know who he beat in that race at, U- at the UK Trials? He beat Jake Whiteman who earlier that year had won the Oslo Diamond League. So he beat a guy who won a Diamond League to make the British team. So he made the World Championships, which neither of those guys have done yet. He's run 333 for 1,500, which is superior to any marks that Fisher or Hunter has put up at any distance. This guy could be making the World Championship final this year. Maybe Drew Hunter could do that, but Drew Hunter, I I talked to him in, in Boston this week. Even he knows he eventually sees himself as a 5k guy, but I also think his chances of meddling in the 5k. I mean, how many white guys have ever meddled in the 5k? It's just very difficult to do. I think Drew's really talented, but it's going to be tough. But Josh Kerr, I think he's got great, an enormous amount of talent in the 1500. I think compared to Fisher and, and Hunter, I just think his odds of meddling in that kind of race are much better. And he's, he's accomplished more to this point in his career. Pretty persuasive argument, John. I, it was going to be hard for me, but you laid it out there. Well, then, do you disagree with any of that? It was pretty well argued. So I'm trying to figure out how Fisher and Hunter are the same age. Because they were, what, a year apart in high school? Well, they're not the same. It, Drew is like, Drew is September of 97, and Grant was April of 97. So Grant is on the younger end for his grade, and Drew is on the older end for his grade. Okay, so it'd only be one year apart in school. So this right. is Fisher's fourth year, and this would be okay. I guess that makes sense. I was just kind of surprised. I still think of Hunter as being younger, which he slightly is, but not much. Um, I mean, the argument's good. Three thirty-three, you're getting there, but okay, yeah. Do I think Grant Fisher or Drew Hunter is going to be a metal threat at fifteen hundred? No. Do I think there'll be a metal threat at five k? It's just a lot harder for a lot of the non-African guys, I feel like you got to go to altitude and you got to start training. Um, So it'll be interesting to see what Fisher does. I think he's, we'll have a lot of upside once he goes to altitude. Um, I think that's sort of underlooked. Yeah. I don't know. I can't really, before when the question was sort of posed, I was like, Oh, I don't know. I want to be Fisher or Hunter one. They're American. So I, I've just heard a lot more about them. Um, but in terms of like who makes more finals and worlds, that sort of stuff, it, it, the answer might be Kerr. I don't know. I just love, but Kerr's going to be limited, right? He's not going to be a 5k guy. So the, the, the upside of, I still like Fisher and Hunter have that unknown, right? Maybe they take to the marathon. Maybe they take to something else. There's a lot more that you can do. Whereas I'm like, okay, Kerr, you're going to become a 328, 1500 guy. That's still a long way to go as well. Um, if you're some 333 guy, okay, well, that's nice, but what's it really going to get you at the end of the day? 
He's 21. He's 21. I don't think he's a 333 I, guy for life. No, I think he's definitely a sub 330. Or, or three, I mean, I, I think that he's progressing nicely. I don't understand why he went and run 330. I, I think in terms of most likely to medal, it's not even close. I, I think it's definitely Kerr. Part of that is the event. I mean, it's just much easier if I'm going to be racist against whites for whites to, 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 to medal in the 1500 than is the 5000. John asked the question, when was the last time a white guy medaled? In the in the five thousand, I'm looking at the world championships. So I don't know if it's ever been done in the Olympics, but 2005, Craig Mottram got the bronze. I mean, Matt Tegenkamp never got it. He was fourth, I think. Zelensky never did it. Um, you got to go all the way back. I mean, before that, there's no one. I mean, the second world championships ever, Jack Buck, Jack Buckner of Britain got a bronze, and then in the first one, actually three white guys, in 83 got. Well, the sport favors altitude based athletes. I mean, so. It's just harder to do. I mean, way harder to do. And and, and the five and the 1500 also tactics play a role. So it's not just a pure fitness test. I mean, I, I think it's – you can get lucky. You can run a great tactical race like Centrowitz did and, and sort of even do higher than you maybe would have done on your fitness. Plus, I think the Kenyans – you know, and the, the Ethiopians really haven't been historically good. At, you're kind of ruling out Ethiopia because they really haven't historically been well at the, at the middle distances events and anything. I mean, I know uh, every once in a while there's a good person there, but what, I had an agent once tell me, he's like, I just don't think they're used to training like mid D guys. So you kind of rule out Ethiopia. It just makes it a lot easier for that event. So here's this follow up question then who would you rather be or who would you rather, who has more potential, Drew Hunter or Grant Fisher? That is a great question. I, uh, I mean, Hunter's got the better PRs: three thirty-five nine versus three thirty-nine, and thirteen twenty-one versus thirteen twenty-nine. And he's younger. I mean, Drew was beating Grant at the end. At the end of his high school career, Drew was beating Grant. He beat him at the Brooks PR meet, and he's run faster for both distances. Like, I, I watch Grant race, and I'm always so impressed. He's a smart racer. He has a good, really good kick. Like, he's so impressive. But I look at Drew and. He just continues to surprise me every time out. I mean, I I think I would have to say Drew, but Drew has also been training like a pro for the last couple of years. I don't think that Tom Schwartz, I think Tom Schwartz has handled him well. I don't think they're doing anything ridiculously aggressive, but I do think Grant, he's definitely, Chris Miltenberg at Stanford has definitely made sure that he's not burning him out. He knows he's got a big talent and he wants him to succeed post-collegiately. I think if he gets with a group like Jerry Schumacher or something, he's going to make some big improvements, but... Is there any doubt this guy goes to Schumacher? I mean, he's got he's signed with Tom Ratcliffe. Um, oh, he did. So then it's done. I mean, yeah, you got to think so. Like Sean McGordy, his friend from Stanford's out there. He seems like he's got Sh- Schumacher's group written all over him. I I'm gonna say Drew. I do think because Drew three thirty five. I don't know. Can Grant run that fast for fifteen hundred yet? I'm not sure, but I'm gonna say Drew has more potential. But I think it's I'm still not convinced. Okay, a couple things. Drew's got the genetics. Both his parents were very good runners. His mom's like an age group champion, and his dad made a world cross country team. So that's a tremendous advantage. Grant's dad was a great. He was on the like collegiate record four by eight team for Arizona State, wasn't he? Oh yeah, I think you're right. Damn it. In terms of training, like pros, I understand the argument, but this was interesting. I don't think I ever typed up this interview. We had it from USA Indoors. Tim and Tom Schwartz, Drew Hunter's coach. But he pointed out a few things. He's like, look, no one in my group is a full-time pro. We're like, what? And he's like, no, all these guys are working. Or I'm like, what about Drew? He's like, Drew goes to school. And I was like, okay, well, Fisher has a lot of upside because he's been going through Stanford. Now he can train as a pro and be better. But he's like, look, Hunter's going to school. We're thinking long-term. So I think they both have very bright futures. I, I think I'm going to go with Hunter. But I don't know. If you asked me two years ago, I would have said Fisher. Even though Hunter was doing so well in high school, but I thought Fisher, you know, he won NCAs, so it was looking really great. Who won more foot lockers, John? Uh, Grant won two to one versus Drew. Also, I want to fact check myself. Grant's father was not on the four by eight record team in Arizona State, but he did run collegiately at Arizona State. So he was a good runner, but not, uh, I, I don't know his PRs. It's kind of like an impossible question like who's better, Matt Tegenkamp or Chris Solinsky? And they end up being very similar. I mean, I kind of feel like you end up sort of hitting the genetic potential. Like, there's a genetic potential for all humans, and there's sort of like a genetic potential for like non-altitude born, like Caucasian white dudes. So they're probably both going to get near there. I mean, at the end, but yeah, it's just yeah, it's pretty fascinating question, isn't it? I think it's really exciting. I'm glad we have two big talents like this on the U.S. scene who are both only 
yeah, well, Grant's 22 now. Drew's 21. I, I, I think it's great for the sport. There's probably really no answer to this. It's ultimately probably going to be what I said. This always comes down to be like, when do you stop improving? I mean, they're, they're very similar right now. So who keeps improving the most or for the longest? I mean, what was the phrase Robert just used about Caucasian? Do you remember what you said, Robert? Caucasian non-altitude board runners? Yeah. And I've been reading this book by called Running to the Edge. It's by Matthew Futterman, my neighbor, New York Times sports editor. It's called The Band of Misfits and the Guru Who Unlocked the Secrets of Speed. It's very interesting. We may have Matthew as a guest by next week because he said, hey, read my book. And I was like, hey, maybe it'll be the podcast. I'm not done yet, but the book really sort of chronicles um, distance running. It's, a, it's about Bob Larson, Meb's coach. And it starts with him back in like growing up in Minnesota. And then he goes to San Diego. And then it sort of traces also like why did U.S. distance running tail off? in the late eighties, early nineties. And it has this theory about Alberto Salazar sort of burning it so hot and people adjusted, overreacted to that. It's very interesting. And it's a story. I'm listening to it as a, you know, on MP3 when I walk my dogs, I really enjoy the story, but a couple of things, like it made me think about, you know, a lot of people weren't training in altitude. Like how many Americans trained to you said non-altitude based. So maybe that's it. But Robert's always into this genetic thing, but like Kenyans and Ethiopians grow up at altitude. Very few Americans do. Like Bob Kennedy never trained at altitude. Like I think it's just a missing ingredient. And these training groups now, obviously, I mean, Jerry's group is based out of Portland, but they do altitude stints. But I think some of that may be more important than, yeah, sure, There's, of course, there could be a genetic component. But like just the Kenyan lifestyle is so different than the American lifestyle. And it's like, you know, what are you going to put yourself through? Where, where, where are you going to go? That sort of stuff. Well, look at the top teams in NCAA cross, BYU and NAU. The situated altitude. I mean, obviously, they haven't won every NCAA title ever, but I got to think like BYU essentially gets it done with Utah kids who just grow up at altitude. NAU has a few altitude guys, and, but they're at like 7,500 feet. I mean, Colorado, that they're women's NCAA champions. I, I do think it's a huge advantage for those schools to be located at altitude. Obviously, they get talent, but you know, that's that's one of the proof that's some proof right there. Obviously, we know we do it, and like when I Essentially, when Let's Run started, I was a, you know, guy who barely made the marathon trials. I quit my job for four months to go train in Flagstaff. And then a year later, I'm number four in the country at 10K. And it was, I totally believed in this high low training. And so I'd, I didn't think much about it. I thought everyone knew to do that. But I realized a lot of people don't do it. And then, sort of, when you trace this book over such a long period, I just sort of know Bob is like, oh, he's Meb's coach. But no, like he, Bob was coaching people in the 70s, the 60s. You know, like people didn't know a lot about distance running then. It's sort of interesting to sort of see a big picture through one guy's career. And it, I don't know, made me think about sort of different things and genetics versus, you know, nature versus nurture, that sort of stuff. Well, well I do have a question about that, though. Now, the the subtitle of the book, didn't they call him like the greatest American distance coach of all time? Or isn't that how they're marketing the book? Is that mentioned at all in there? And do you agree or disagree with this claim that Bob Larson is the greatest American distance coach ever? No, he's not the greatest American distance coach ever. Someone said the athletes you get, but I don't see that on the book. I mean, it's funny now I'm going to... Oh, okay. I know. I'm on the Amazon page here. In the dusty hills above San Diego, Bob Larson became America's greatest running coach. I mean, I think that's that's marketing, right? Because I think at first I was like, wait, a book on Bob Larson? Like... Who's going to read that? You know, I feel like I knew Bob and I really like Bob and Meb and Bob is sort of, in some ways I can relate to him and let's run. Like, I don't know, Robert and I, you know, Robert will joke about being controversial and the best and that, but let's run sort of understated, right? Like we'll make jokes in the podcast, but like, it's not all pretty and polished. You sort of find what you want. And Bob's never like tooted his own, own horn. I don't know. Maybe I, I kind of thought that and then some of the marketing, I'm like, well, how are they going to market this book? I I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite done with it, but I'm really enjoying it just sort of a, almost as like the story it, it, it's it, it's told it's you know sort of designed it's not meant to be some like di- dry training book it's like a story and sometimes i wonder like okay is this is the story a little bit um you know a little bit dramatic or something but it, it, it's an interesting read or listen essentially for me so what, what's the line again john that you're asking about the line on the Amazon page in the sort of description of the book, it says, in the dusty hills above San Diego, Bob Lawson became America's greatest running coach. 
It's funny because I'm on the Amazon page and right now I don't see that. You got to click read more and it'll be right there. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think it's great that, you know, a New York Times writer has written a book about Bob Larson, who, yeah, is known for being the coach of Meb Kofleski, obviously a successful coach, but somewhat overlooked figure in our sport. So I think it's cool that we've got a whole book about him and his backstory and the Hamill Toads and that sort of thing. But I do think it's a bit of a stretch. to Maybe at the time, I don't, I don't even know at the time, but I think it's a stretch to call him America's greatest running coach. He's a great coach, but... The greatest, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the greatest is always up for debate. I definitely wouldn't say Bob is because... Well, ha- no, it has to be John Kelleher myself, or if you want to give it to both of us, that would be appreciated. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, are, are, are we considered retired? <laughs> um, speaking of altitude, one question. John, does, does Galen Rupp, he doesn't even go to altitude anymore. Does he have an altitude in his house? I mean, I Yeah, don't... yeah. He has like, I think even the, is he the part of his house or like his whole house is essentially, they can seal it up to mimic like living at 8,000 feet or something like that. Yeah. So it, interesting test case for his children who, you know, kind of quote unquote grew up at altitude because their house will be at like 8,000 feet all the time. It'll be interesting to see how they turn out. My son screwed because that. Okay, John. Yeah, now I'm seeing it. America's greatest running coach. I never would have called Bob that. You know, it's sort of interesting also because, like, once he went to UCLA, before that, he was more of a, you know, focus on the distance guys. But he goes to UCLA and he's like, I got to be the best. So I got to focus on sprinting and putting more scholarships there. And then he gave, gave, gave Meb a full ride and the rest is sort of history. But then it even talks about, like, now I'm at the point where, like, running USA starts. They give some money to these training groups. And sort of we take it for granted now, these training groups. And I was like, well, there's always people training and runners going off and training, that sort of stuff. I mean, I, on my own, quit my job. I went to Flagstaff. I trained by myself. I wasn't in a group. But like the concept of people getting together wasn't that crazy to me. But Bob and V Hill sort of century said, like, we need to do this group thing. And now, like, you have like the Brooks group, the OTC group. I mean, some of these things kind of existed, but I think definitely from the shoe company's perspective now, the groups are better for marketing, but also then you get a group of guys who train together. Well, we had a big show. I'm going to end it with some stream of consciousness. You know, strap in for this, people. Who knows where this this is going? Rojo unhinged. I'm just thinking more about this Semenya thing and this and this document that came. Out. And part of the document is they're worried about like they the, the CAS acknowledged that they may say some offensive things and the thing about how you refer to people. And people are making a point that IWF called Semenya a biological male with a female gender identity. But they're 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 trying to make the point like it's very hard. to to talk about this. I mean, one of the things that the CS said was like, or people are saying it in defense of so many is it's discriminatory, but no one seems to acknowledge that all of women's sports is discriminatory. Like the whole, like women's sports discriminates against me. If we didn't have a female category, if, if you can't say that Robert Johnson can't compete in the female category, I would be an Olympian with my two twenty three marathon PR. I shouldn't be an Olympian in the women's category, but it discriminates against me because it says I can't be a woman because I'm not a woman. So the real question is sort of like who belongs in this category. Anyways, enough of that. Uh, I, I should vow to start talking about Alberta Salazar every week instead of talking about Castro Semenya or CeCe Telfer because it's so frustrating to me. Well, we did hit our Salazar quota um, earlier when we talked about the USADA investigation. So good job. Oh, I did. That. Oh, good, good. I forgot about that. Yeah, the discrimination thing. That hit in my head. We were recapping one of the Diamond League 800 women's ones. I remember thinking, like, I said, oh, she's the best in the world. And then I'm like, no, she's the best in the female category. I'm like, are we going to have to start writing about it that way to sort of drive home this point that we're not trying to enforce these rules to be bigots because, but because it's important and fair. What if the IWF just had a transgender or NCAA just had a transgender, a men's and women's championship and a transgender championship? You wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't have enough athletes to complete the fields i don't think or the quality would just be so low it might but it might make the argument more obvious like okay we'll have one person out there cc you can run in the 400 hurdles by yourself that'd just be a farce what's the point of that well just to get people to understand that we're not trying to discriminate we're just trying to make it fair i don't i don't really think that solves anything but all right well show's gone too long if you want to reach us 844 let's run 844-538-7786 we hope you've enjoyed the podcast if you haven't read Jonathan Galt's 5,000 shot put feature on Michael Carter, the unbreakable record has turned 40. Folks, Michael Carter 40 years ago threw the shot put so far that in the 40 years since, no one has come within four feet of it. Pretty amazing. The guy has won a Super Bowl. He's an all-pro. He won an Olympic silver medal, but he said his best accomplishment was that throw. So check it out right now on the website. 
I'm, st- I'm interrupting real quick. We should have talked to John about like what it was like to talk to Michael Carter. You know, if we had some some other guy interviewed, I don't know, Gabriel Slassi and was talked to him for a long time. Be interesting to talk about that. So maybe we can do that next week. But John, it's a fabulous piece. Congratulations on it. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, maybe next time we can talk about Michael Carter. All right. I, I would enjoy that. Good talking to you guys this week. Peace. If you're still listening, thank you for listening. You can always email us feedback at podcast at letsrun.com. And also, reminder, we'd love to hear your thoughts on our Better Running Shoes site, letsrun.com slash shoes. Give us feedback and please review a shoe. Let'srun.com slash shoes. Thank you.